All right, hello FRC world, and a big SOS goes out to our guest speakers tonight to uh, solve a lot of the problems and issues that some teams may be having. Welcome to our first webinar of 2014, and this of course being our third webinar overall this season, and it promises to be a good one. I'm John Hobbins, your moderator for tonight, and we have Rajiv Galva as the co-moderator for this evening. We have with us the knowledgeable, the kinetic, the kind-hearted keynote speaker, and sometimes kooky, Karthik Kanagasapathy. <laughs> Joining Karthik here tonight to jumpstart our 2014 webinar series is the jazzy jock of FRC himself, who is always justified in his opinions, Justin Montoise. <laughs> and moving right along, we welcome the magnanimous, majestic maven of the FRC world, Mike Stark. We all want the audience to know that we have other FRC experts on the call also tonight joining us with the webinar, FTAs, inspectors, and so on, so don't hesitate to ask any type of question. Before we begin this outrageous show, we need to address a few logistics for the evening. All information discussed tonight is not the opinion of First Robotics Canada and should be considered non-binding regarding the overall FRC competitions and related rules. As the show progresses, I will intervene at timely intervals to bring questions to the attention of the guest speakers. Please submit your questions throughout the webinar, and your questions will be put in queue. Please put your team number with the question when you submit them, and note that we have a very large audience tonight, uh, so submit your questions early. And while the webinar is in progress, all attendees will be muted to prevent audio interference, but you may click the raise the hand icon if you need to speak. And now for our first segment of the night is the first update. A little bit of information for teams out there that this may affect them. Uh, regarding Argosy grants, the teams that were fortunate enough to receive the Argosy grants, these rookie teams of course, that have paid their first event registration prior to receiving the Argosy monies, these teams should know that they will be contacted by First Headquarters USA over the next week or two, unless you want to contact them yourself at AR at usfirst.org to request a refund. And you can see that um, at the bottom of the page of the screen now. Additional event registrations for your second and third events and those fortunate enough to go to the championships, your payments are due this Friday, January 24th. Teams are also encouraged to frequently visit the usfirst.org website for further information such as first forms where you can gain and participate in discussion groups for programming, control systems, game strategies and many others. We here in Canada are very excited to roll out two new regional FRC events in North Bay, one in Windsor and of course the stellar Waterloo event which promises to be a big event with teams coming up from way down south including Team 254. And of course the two GTR events, the East and the West. And week one, as it's fast approaching, brings the new GTR West event at Crescent School. This should be a terrific event to watch on our outstanding webcast. And a final message from the guru of FRC himself, Mr. Mark Bredner. He has asked me to remind teams to inform their students about the terrific scholarships available. And note, if we don't apply, we may lose them. And now, without further delay, may I introduce to you Karthik, Mike, and Justin. And let me thank, start by thanking the three of you for taking time to help the FRC community. How are you guys doing tonight? Uh, good. Good. Uh, you know, it's it's build season, so it's you know exhausting and all that sort of jazz. But you know, doing all right. How about you guys, Mike, Justin? We're doing really well. I think kind of right there with you, and I uh, had a great time at Build Bloods, and kind of recovering since, and uh, getting right through build season. Yeah, things with our teams are going great, and I think based on what I've seen on Chief Delphi, lots of teams are finding success early, so that's good. And teams aren't finding somewhat success early. That's kind of what we're here for. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, that's having, great. Uh, and first Robotics Canada, um, we really loved our time last year, and thanks for having us back. Well, that's great, and I remember last year promising you guys a Tim Hortons coffee when you came up here, <laughs> and sure enough, you showed up at the Waterloo, so I will up that to uh, either a Starbucks or a different kind of beverage when you guys arrive, so I'll keep that in I mind. Have the Tim Hortons. Yeah, well, we'll be back <laughs> yeah. to Waterloo for sure, so. Yeah, and Rajiv, can I ask you to please pass the controls over to Justin and Mike, and they will interview Karthik. Great. Um, so, uh, again, thanks for having us, and uh, we really appreciate you guys um, tuning in tonight. And we have a lot to talk about with Karthik, 
And uh, we're going to be talking about Build Blitz and everything that happened at Build Blitz, as well as we're going to talk about Aerial Assist and how things are going and, and all everything about that. And then hopefully we'll talk about some comments here at the end and anything you guys would like to bring up as well. Yeah, we have a good two-hour time block here, uh, so plenty of time for questions. As, as John said, get them in early so we can kind of prepare for that and make sure that we get to as many questions as possible. But first, um, so <laughs> we kind of <coughs> talked about it pre-show, and Karthik alluded to it just then, almost like we planned it. McCarthy's feeling a little bit under the weather last uh, last week as he was off the build blitz. Maybe he wants to talk about that and kind of the uh, the endurance marathon that was the 72-hour build blitz. Well, I mean, you know, for those of you who don't know what build blitz was, um, basically uh, there was a bunch of groups around uh, North America and uh, who decided that they would build um, FRC competition robots for aerial assist in 72 hours. So. Um, Innovation First and Bex Robotics put forth two of those teams, uh, Team Copioli and Team JBN. We were down in Texas, and you know, we got the game rules at you know, 11 o'clock like everyone else did, and then we went boom right into it and built a robot in three days. And it was um, a arduous experience, to <laughs> say the least. And, uh, at, yeah, it was, it was tiring, it was long, but I think it was rewarding for the community in general. Yeah, you worked um, very closely, for those of you that don't know, um, you can check out all the information about Bill Blitz on um, Blitz.com. There's a ton of resources on there. Um, so just putting them out there. Um, there are two teams, Team JVN with uh, John Noon and Team Copioli with Paul Copioli. Um, could you maybe describe what your role was uh, for Team Copioli and, and um, just maybe talk about you know what you got to see because of that? Well, I had two main roles with Team Copioli. The, the the primary role was to be kind of the voice of the teams, just so we could get information out to the community about what we were doing. So I was writing blog posts, I was updating the Twitter box, just kind of letting everyone know the exact process. Because the goal wasn't just to build a robot in three days. It was a lot more than that. The goal was to show teams the process that goes into it. Um, I think back to Dean Kamen's speeches back when I was a high school student, so we're talking 1998. And one of the things he constantly talked about was that FRC, like the part of the mission of FRC was to show young people the magic of engineering and giving them the chance, because we see engineering in action every day, everywhere we look, computers, cars, machines, that's all the result of amazing engineers. But no one really understands how those those awesome creations get made. And so part of what FIRST was about was to show, you know, like give everyone a look behind the curtain, give high school students a chance to work hand in hand with professional engineers to see what they do and to get them excited about science and technology that way. And <laughs> as FIRST has grown from when I started about 150 teams to now you know, upwards of 2,700, the program's exploded, but there's so many teams who don't have access to engineers directly. Like back in the day, every team had engineering mentors. It was just the way it was, where you have teams with 15 students and 15 engineers, and that's just kind of what was happening. But now it's a little bit more scarce. So kind of what we were trying to do with Bill Blitz was to show um, high school students of today how professional engineers would take on the task of a six-week build season, except to make it even more challenging and to make it more useful for teams, we tried to condense it into three days. So. Uh, my job on you know, Team Copioli was to help show everyone the magic that was going on behind the scenes, or at some point, the lack of magic. <laughs> yeah. And, was and then my other role on Team Copioli was um, to really kind of assist and direct with the strategy that the team was taking on, um, facilitate the brainstorming processes. That's always been a strength of mine. Um, had a little bit of success with it in the past with my own team. And... Uh, kind of go forward there to do that and kind of, you know, work on some of the calculations and just the strategic input, the strategic design of the robot. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, so obviously from, from the VexPro side of it, you guys spent a lot of time planning Bill Blitz. It certainly was quite an undertaking. But as you kind of were in the middle of it and now looking back on it, is there anything that particularly surprised you as a, you know, as a result of Bill Blitz? <clears throat> uh, there was a lot of things that surprised me. I think... Um, when you work on your own team for so many years and then you've never seen another team in action, you kind of think, you, you start to get these ideas of that, oh, well, my team, this is the way our team runs and no other teams like this. But I think working with mentors from six or seven different FRC teams, it was interesting for me to see that a lot of teams are just, we all go through the same struggles, the same sort of 
you know, you get to, you know, to the testing phase and you're all excited because your robot's about to run for the first time and then you forgot a line of code and you forgot to plug in a PWM cable and you left the tool at the practice field and so on and so forth. So that the struggles that you thought were uniquely yours aren't really uniquely yours. So everyone's going through these similar things. So that was one thing I learned. Um, another one was I learned is that you can do, I, I'd say there's probably some, pretty much every FRC team operates a little bit inefficiently because we were able just by focusing and keeping things simple to get competition ready robots in three days and that was, I was there, you know, I'm not, not trying to pat ourselves on the back or anything, but if you just look at all five of the organizations who did the robots in three days, they all got very competent robots built in three days. So that was, I, I was honestly terrified that we weren't going to be able to finish, especially when we set goals upon ourselves, not only to build a robot in three days, but to get full CAD done, to have um, documentation, calculation, blog posts, videos, to have all this sort of stuff done. I. I'll admit that I was skeptical that we could do it all, so I was, you know, I was impressed by that. I was also impressed uh, and surprised at um, how much you can do when you focus on simple tasks uh, and just a simple build process. On Keep Pilbioli, the goal was to not do any custom fabricated parts that couldn't be fabricated with uh, simple hand tools. And so just using, you know, commercial off-the-shelf parts and a, a drill and a bandsaw, we were able to build that robot, you know, just using gusset plates and all sorts of, you know, just ready-made parts. And that was pretty impressive that, I mean, I just think about how many resources are available to teams right now, and that was, yeah, that was kind of eye-opening. Yeah, it was, it was quite amazing being there, just seeing, yeah. you know, six weeks scrunch down into 72 hours. and. I think what both teams were able to accomplish was absolutely incredible. You know, we talked about it in one of the live look ins, but really, I would, the thing I was most surprised, I would say, was how, like, how true it was to see all of six weeks truly compressed into 72 hours. I mean, things happen much, much faster. Yeah. The highs, the lows, the struggles, the successes, everything that you see over six weeks <coughs> happened in 72 hours, just super condensed. Right. We saw all the same emotions. They had, at, in the shop there at IFI, they had a, a clock on the wall that related. The countdown in hours to the week it was um, in that normal build build season. So with you know 20 hours ago we were like in week five or something like that in normal build season. And I think John brought out a good point saying like is that there was one point where both teams were um, had were just struggling a little bit, um, just tuning things up, you know, tuning things in or whatever. And he made a great point saying this is actually pretty normal for this you know for most teams um, at this specific time in build season. So, um, yeah, and Mike, uh, Mike and Justin, if I could just ask you, one of the listeners or a couple of them have asked if you guys could uh, either speak louder, or turn up your volume, or speak directly at your mic, which might help. Sure. They say that Karthik's overpowering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that right. that has been said before. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Karthik, with only seventy-two hours of you know, only having seventy-two hours, what was it like um, doing strategy? you know, in under two hours. Um, I mean, most teams, you know, take, you know, obviously much longer than yeah. two hours to, to decide. So what was it like being in such an intense strategy session? Well, <clears throat> for years I've been doing presentations, you know, on behalf of First Robotics Canada about um, how to analyze the game and how to break down the game. And one of the things I always suggest is the first thing you do is take 24 hours to read and digest the rules. So that was out the window, considering we had to do everything in two hours. <laughs> so like the whole digesting period. So I guess the biggest challenge was going through the brainstorming process and making sure that we actually understood what the game rules were saying. Because there's a lot of discrete things in there that you kind of want to read through and read through. And I think one challenge that is so important for teams, and even still in week three to be doing this, is if you're in your shop and you're having a discussion about the rules, and someone's like, oh, well, you know, uh, you can't have an assist go backwards. The first thing I'm going to say is, show me the rule. Show me the rule. Because the only way you can be sure in those early stages is you actually have to look at the rule. Because people naturally start making assumptions based on language. And 
it's easy to look at the word assist and make an assumption based on what we see as an assist in hockey or in basketball. But the word ass the assist is defined very specifically for um, aerial assist. And as such, you need to make sure you're kind of understanding that. Uh, so I think it's very, yeah, it's very crucial that everyone has a good understanding of the rules. And having only two hours to do that for strategy-wise, it was, um, that was intense. And also, I think there was definitely some nerves to make sure we didn't miss anything. I mean, even though we had some people who were very experienced strategists, when you're trying to blast through things in two hours, and you also have an element of groupthink going on, it's um, you know a little bit nervy. Um, I see one of the questions we have there. Uh, would you say you misread the game in any way because of the compressed strategy session? If you did it again, would you change any of the strategy conclusions you reached? Um, I don't think we misread the game. I think we, we <coughs> when you look at the priority list we came up with, we, I, I feel very confident that we kind of nailed the game in terms of the, you know, the number one item is obviously to be able to drive. Then you need to be able to get rid of a preloaded ball. Then you need to be able to receive a ball somehow from um, an inbounder. Or, and then you need to be able to deliver a ball to, you know, to a partner. Like we really captured the assist portion. However, I do think that once we started building, like we said, you know, passing and the low goal was like way up there, one of the top priorities. And then we got down the road of, oh wait, shooting and scoring to the high goals, pretty easy. Let's just focus on this. Let's just focus on this. And we turned ourselves, both teams turned themselves into, you know, fairly proficient high goal scorers. However, I think we probably could have paid more attention to the low goal because I think it would have been more valuable for more teams if there was attention paid to the logo and paid specifically to passing. The game is called aerial assist. <laughs> yeah, I think you nailed it. I think just uh, the amount of time it takes to digest a game um, is just was not you know possible at Bill Blitz. And you know things like I know the Q&A the Q was a little first Q&A was is it was it open a little later than usual this year? I don't know. Oh, is it? Okay. So not having that Q&A with some clarifications or some rule updates, you really have to go on what's there, you know, at that moment. And I think, again, you guys you know, did a great job. And So, Karthik, how often would you say that happens in your, your typical six-week build season where you, you have your initial strategy, but kind of as you try to work through the game, you realize that things that were lower on your priority list um, turn out to be a lot easier than you expected, and you end up changing uh, much of your strategy, which I think on Team Paul, Kio Paul Copioli happened quite a bit um, because the you know the high goal scoring I remember was quite low on the list, and that bumped up very high. So do you see that a lot, even in the six-week build season, or with the time to digest the 24 hours that you typically have, um, you're more accurate, I guess, with your initial assessment. No, I I think you definitely see it because uh, one of the things when you're creating your priority list, one of the biggest things you're looking for is the um, the reward to effort ratio. And by reward, you know, in terms of points and in terms of contribution to your ranking and the effort in terms of how hard is it going to be to build a subsystem that it can perform the task that's going to get that reward. And the reward portion, that can be analyzed in your initial game analysis in the first, you know, 48 hours. You should be able to figure that out and kind of nail it. The effort side of it, a lot of that's dependent on prototyping. So tasks that seem very difficult, um, might end up being easier than you think in prototyping. On the flip side of it, I, I mean, I think I used last year as an example. I think a lot of teams last year initially thought that full court shooting was way too hard. And then they played around with some shooters. They built a simple shooter, and then they said, oh, let's just you know, um, turn the motors all the way up and see what happens and see how far the disc goes. And they're like, oh, maybe full court <laughs> shooting is more viable. So if the effort ratio, the effort's lower, so you're, you know, your denominator is getting smaller, then your overall item is, hey, it's more valuable. It's moving up on your priority list. On the flip side of things, if you think about um, last year, I think a lot of teams during prototyping, um, you know, initially they might have said, we need a floor pickup. We absolutely need a floor pickup. And then they tried to pick up these Frisbees and were like, ah, it's harder. <laughs> so I think um, your priority list can be a bit of a moving target, and it's important. That's why teams need to prototype. That's why it's so difficult for teams to just start building right away without kind of um, going through and engaging the effort. Because I think veteran teams, a lot of veteran teams, um, have a good idea of how difficult tasks can be because they've done similar tasks. I mean, this year's game is 
the task being employed is very similar to the exact same task in 2004, just scaled up by, uh, scaled down rather, in terms of size of the ball. So I think a lot of those teams have a, you know, could probably have a more solid priority list at the very beginning, while younger teams have to do more prototyping. Now, on the flip side of all that is that this year there were five robots in three days that um, took place across North America, and they all did a huge amount of prototyping that a lot of teams have been bore witness to. And so as such, they now have ideas, things, the difficulty of certain things. Karthik, I'm going to invite Sean uh, Lavery to ask a question. He's posted a couple questions for the three of you. And perhaps, uh, Sean, you can say your team number and ask the question yourself. So go ahead. Are you there, Sean? The microphone. He just put in the question that he doesn't, he doesn't have, have a microphone. He doesn't actually have a microphone, but I can I can read Sean's question out, or Mike and Justin, you guys want to read Sean's second question sure. out, the one from seven. So Sean's Sean's question was: Given the very unusual alliance-based scoring structure of aerial assist, how do you analyze the point-based rewards of actions? Additional points per cycle. <clears throat> well. Uh, one of the things that we looked at on Team Copioli, I thought was very important, was that there were two there were two types of points that were scored. There were some points which were, as I call, bank, points that were in the bank for the um, actual scoring in the goals and um, throwing over the truss and catching, because you got those points no matter what in the cycle. The assist points were now assists are so valuable. I, I mean, that second assist can get you twenty points. However, assist points are only valuable if the actual cycle can be converted into a goal. So you had to kind of lower the expectation on the assist points and almost throw a, multiple, uh, you know, a fractional multiplier upon it to say, I mean, assists are great. However, an assist isn't worth anything until it gets actualized. Like for FRC old timers, if you think back, there was a game in 2002 where you got a single point for every ball that was in a goal but the goal had to be in a specific location on the field. So scoring balls into the goal wasn't necessarily worth points unless the goal was in a certain position. And it's the same sort of thing here. I mean, if you look at um, the basketball example, you know, with passing, you can have a great point guard. You can go and take Chris Paul, and then, you know, but if you dropped him onto the Charlotte Bobcats, his value as a point guard lowers because he's going to have no one to finish for him. So. Assists are a very important part of this game, but they have to be devalued because you weren't necessarily guaranteed to get those points depending on the completion of a cycle. Now, one thing we did realize was <clears throat> um, the comparison between scoring in the high goal and scoring in the low goal. Um, this was a big eye-opener for Team Copioli when it kind of hit us. So scoring in the high goal, 10 points. Scoring in the low goal, 1 point. Well, right away you see you know, a differential of a factor of 10, where scoring in the t high goal is 10 times more important, right? Well, deeper analysis showed that's not necessarily true, because you only get one of those points per cycle. However, each goal you score can convert other points for you. It can convert assist points. Mm. So if you look at it, with a, a maximum cycle scoring in the high goal was worth 60 points while a maximum cycle scoring the logo was worth 51 points. And suddenly that differential is, whoa, it's, it's been brought together. So before um, scoring the logo was only 10% of scoring in the high goal, suddenly it's 51 to 60, so you're looking at an 85%. So at that point, we started to realize, wow, this logo is super, super valuable. The other part of it is, <clears throat> um, what happens when you don't score an autonomous mode? And not scoring in autonomous mode means that you cannot establish, start a cycle until all three balls have been scored from autonomous mode. So the risk of attempting a high goal shot and missing an autonomous, that's a pretty painful penalty if you don't score it. But if you just go for the low goal, you'll get points for scoring in the low goal, and you'll allow your cycles to begin. So that low goal is more valuable than I think most people realize. I also think that a lot of teams guys kind of think that, oh, well, just pushing something into, a, you know, or across the ground, it's really easy. It is easy, but it's not as easy as people think. There's a significant, what's the height of that lip, guys? Do you remember? Seven inches. Yeah, there's a seven-inch lip, and I know it's a 24-inch ball. It should just kind of roll nicely through there, but 
it does take a little bit of work to score that logo. So I think teams who are just going to say, ah, we'll figure out the logo or, you know, eventually, whatever, we're a high goal scorer. You could be in a bad position if you get to your first event and your autonomous mode's not working and you don't actually have a way to do a logo autonomous mode. All of a sudden, you are now a liability to an alliance. True. And no one wants yep. to be that. No, certainly not. So... <laughs> I think since kickoff, I've gone back and forth on this game about 10 times. I like it, I don't like it, I like it, I don't like it. So I, I know, Karthik, you shared kind of your initial thoughts when we were uh, doing Build Blitz, but have they changed it all kind of since then? And where do you, where do you stand on Aerial Assist right now? <clears throat> I mean, I don't dislike Aerial Assist. Um, I definitely dislike some first games in the past, and there's not even, like, one major component that I dislike about it. Like, I mean, going back to... I guess 2006, like 2000, uh, let's go as far back as 2005. 2005, I thought, was a very good game, except there were way too many penalties for um, not important things across the loading zone, which I thought kind of broke the game. Um, 2006 was a pretty solid game, other than the introduction of the Serpentine Draft, which was dumb, but, you know, <laughs> beyond that. 2007, I thought the ramps were overvalued, so I thought that was kind of a game-breaker. Um, 2008, I didn't think was necessarily the most spectator friendly at times, especially if you didn't have robots that could launch over. Uh, 2009 I thought was an unmitigated disaster uh, <laughs> because of the, um, the human players were scoring 55% of the points, so it wasn't a robot focused game. Um, 2010, you know, the, the possession rules were counterintuitive, but the ranking system was kind of uh, funky. Uh, 2011, the overvalue of the mini bots was, you know, not the best thing. 2012, um, the cooperation bridge. So you can see all these games were something that were, you just strongly disliked it. Then there was 2013. Um, what was it? Ultimate Assault, Ultimate Ascent. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember game names. It was a beautiful game. It, yeah. it, it, it was absolutely amazing. I thought the GDC just nailed it. So I think that looking at Aerial Assist, I think it's definitely not as good of a game as Ultimate Assault. Uh, assist. <laughs> Ascent. Ah! But there's nothing about it that I just overly dislike. I just, I'm just not in love with the game. I think that um, it's not going to be the most spectator friendly because I think the audience is going to be confused about assists because um, you, most people are going to have this idea of an assist as, as like the hockey assist, you know, from stick to stick to goal. But here, an assist, and I, I want to talk about this in detail when we go into the game, an assist can be a robot leaves the ball in the zone and another robot just goes and pushes it into the wall for a second and they get an assist for that. Like, imagine getting an assist in hockey for just, you know, ramming the puck into the boards and just holding it there for a second. Like, that, <laughs> you know, so. But, so I think there's that portion of it, but I, I think it's a good game. I think um, the challenge for veterans has been done before, but for, I mean, anyone who's been from 2009 to 2013, that's more than 60, 70% of first. Um, yeah. it's, it's a big challenge for them, so. I think it's a nice game. I'm not in love with it yet, but I definitely don't think there's nothing about it that I dislike. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if I could just jump in for a second, a question for Karthik. And I'll start off first, Karthik, by telling you that I, I quite liked last year's game, 2013, for many reasons. <laughs> and number two, uh, how easy have you found it to catch the ball for this year's game? And what troubles have you anticipated or experienced with that? Well, I mean, I don't have a robot yet, so I, I, I don't know how difficult it is to catch the balls. But I, I think it will be difficult. I mean, if you think about it, first robots generally have, as much as we have alliances, they haven't had to work together. I, I guess the cooperation bridge and, well, just the bridges in general in 2012 was, you know, robots working together. But I mean, a lot of it was just kind of, you stay there and don't move, and we're going to push you up the bridge. <laughs> and it, yeah. and even still, teams had a difficult time lining up a train of three robots to get them all onto the same bridge. Like, that took a lot of coordination. And so teams now have a hard enough time, you know, just lining up a robot to shoot at a static goal. I mean, if you look at shooting percentages uh, throughout the years in first games, um, they've ranged, the average shooting percentage has usually been around 50-55%. It was a little bit higher last year. But we're talking about little tiny frisbees in a giant goal. So now this year you have a 24-inch ball that you're going to try and shoot into a robot that has dimensions of about you know 20, 
24 inches by 32 inches. And even if that robot expands, with their, you know, the 20 inches you can expand out, that's a small target. And guess what? That's a moving target. And mm. it's not, like, you don't know where that robot's going to be. It's not like the goal where it's always going to be in the same place at the same time. That robot can move in multiple positions on the field. Also, that robot's going to have to deal with defense. Because if I know that Team um, 1234 is the best catching robot uh, in the match, I'm going to be all over them. I can yeah. ram them repeatedly. I can hover over top of them. I can stick my arm 20 inches over top of them. There's all sorts of things I can do. Catching is going to be difficult. Even but then uh, again, sorry, right. go on. No, no, no. I was just going to say there's, there's obviously going to be some teams out there who just kind of magically unfold a magic blanket and can catch everything. <laughs> but I think in general, I, I mean, I just I think of all the games where teams have to interact, like 2007 how difficult it was for a team to climb onto another team's ramp. They would drive off the side, drive off the edge, someone would move. Oh, yeah. it, coordination between two teams is difficult stuff. Mm -hmm. I think down at Bill Blitz, um, we, were in the, we were in the judges' room for a little while there, but um, from what we saw, even JVN was trying to pass the team Copioli, and out of, I don't know how many times they tried, only a couple, I think, went in. I think, like you said, that there's going to be there's going to be teams that do it great, and there's going to be alliances that do it great, and I think it'll just time will tell to see, you know, just what those what those numbers are and what those statistics are. Yeah, I, I think consistent go ahead, Carpe. Sorry. consistent catching is going to be the most difficult task in the game, even more difficult than um, scoring in the hot goal and autonomous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just in the prototyping we've done in our shop with, you know, in the plywood boxes and stuff that we've made. If it's not a if it's not a pretty um, accurate shot or you don't have some way to deaden that blow, those balls love to bounce. I mean, if it catches an edge wrong, it bounces off the other side of the field. It's just it's going to be a very difficult thing to kind of um, do last minute. I think if you want to catch if you want to catch it, the ball and that is you know part of your primary strategy. It needs to be something that you're designing for throughout the entire process. If it's something you try to throw on um, later in the process, like almost a blocker for the full court shooters last year. You won't you you won't find very much success. So excellent. Uh, sorry, uh, it looks like we have a few questions from Peter Moore. His hand is up, uh, so he wants to get involved with the discussions. So Peter, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering about the uh, effect of a defensive goalie bot frustrating an autonomous and keeping some of the uh, autonomous balls on the field, which would then delay the start of the scoring cycle during the match. And then during the match, uh, a good defensive bot uh, interrupting cycles and really increasing the cycle time for a team during a match. Well, hey, I mean, Peter. yeah, that's a very good question. And it's two distinct questions. Um, in terms of the goalie bot in autonomous, um, I, if someone can make an effective goalie with some degree of intelligence during the autonomous mode, that can be a deadly robot. It can just put a huge hamper on alliances. Now, the game design committee, um, with one of the team updates, really put a damper in the goalie bot plan because they basically said that the goalies have to set up first, and then the offensive robots can set up. So, if the goalie sets up, you know, in a position to block, you know, where's the camera? Set up. <laughs> ah, it's my finger. It's my good finger, not the wrong finger. If they set up over here, I'm going to set up my robot, you know, over here, and I can set up last. That way, I can kind of I know where the goalie is. However, if someone can build a goalie bot that can track to what the other robots are doing, all it takes is just to block one shot in autonomous. You block one shot. Now the other alliance cannot start cycling. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, by putting a goalie bot back there, you've given up one of your balls in autonomous that need to be scored. So all of a sudden, your alliance has to find a way to score that other ball. So, I mean, there's a lot of talk out there of teams doing multiple ball autonomous modes so that, I mean, if you have the alliance that can afford to have a goalie during autonomous and that goalie can then block one shot, that is a huge, huge win. Um, being forced to chase down those extra balls is, uh, you're going to be behind. Now, when it comes to defense, during the cycle, I mean, Mike and Justin, we talked about this during Build Blitz, that 
there's only one ball per alliance. So what are the other two robots doing when robot three is possessing the ball and doing its thing? They are sitting around waiting to either get in a known position or they're messing around with the other alliance. I just feel that there's going to be more defense played this year. than the, This is going to have the most defense probably since 2007. Wouldn't you guys mm -hmm. agree? I completely agree. <clears throat> and I think I was, personally, I was surprised at how effective a lot of defense was last year with these huge pyramids in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the thing, and a lot of that was attributed to this, you know, the low profile robots. But with a wide, o you know, with a wide open field like this, I, you know, I think it's going to be every match you're going to see it. Yeah, I think in uh, to kind of touch on Peter's point, I think at the low, at the I hate to say the low level, but at some of the regionals where the competition isn't as high as perhaps some other events, I think a good defensive bot that can take one ball away. You know, Carthy talks about it a lot in his strategy discussions that preventing your opponent from scoring is, you know, just like you scoring. So blocking one ball headed to the hot goal is just like you scoring that for your own alliance. And you, when you introduce the lag time of having to track that ball down and then score it, um, the, the points uh, even goes up even higher. So I think that at the, at the lower regionals, defense is going to dominate. I think, at the, um, I think at the high level, it's going to be a very fun and exciting game to watch. At the low levels, I think defense will see a fair bit of success. I mean, Peter's point was yeah. spot on that the fact that not only are you taking that 15 points away or 20 points if it's a hot goal, you're also now <coughs> taking points away in teleop. Yeah. Not only you're putting in lag time. time. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a great point. I think something that is is um, maybe not looked at as highly as it should be. Just the value of how a great defensive bot could be and how devastating it could be for the alliance. Yeah. Karthik, if I could jump in for a second here on this. Let's assume we have a disastrous autonomous and all three robots miss the goal. So there's three balls on the ground. Could you walk through, and, and I'm thinking about rookie teams and so on here, what would be the first, second, and third thing they need to do, obviously, to get those balls through the goal and do those goals count or not? Could you just talk about that for a moment? Sure. Um, if if all three balls aren't scored in autonomous, uh, you cannot begin a cycle until the, all three of them have been scored. So if, if every ball has been missed, you can still earn points for scoring those balls, but you, can no, you can't earn any assist points, you can't earn any catch points, you can't earn any, mm -hmm. any trust points. So, I mean, if you're on an alliance where you've missed all three balls you're in autonomous, you need to score them as quickly as possible. I, and when you're talking about quickly, you probably want to get them into the local because that's the easiest target. And, I, I mean, it's going to be kind of scary because, I mean, how many matches have we, like, for example, this year, like, you, you think of the last two years, having teams score all their balls or discs in autonomous, that was a big deal. Remember, like, mm -hmm. the round of applause when you see the 36-point autonomous mode in 2012? Yeah. Or yeah. this yes. year with the 12? But that was a rare thing. So this is going to be happening often. And if you have teams that can't quickly score, we're going to see some very low-scoring matches. Especially now, if I know that... Um, so say my alliance scores three balls in autonomous mode, and I'm playing a team that missed three balls, we can all play, We have a huge lead, and they can't mm -hmm. score any major points until those balls get cycled. So you can do a lockdown defensive strategy at that point. It's, uh, and also... Um, with the way the, uh, I guess it was the team update that came out uh, earlier this week, or maybe it was last week. Yeah, it was last Friday's team update, where they said that you are allowed to deflect your opponent's balls. I mean, ball defense becomes really viable. So if someone's trying to, you know, pick up that ball, you could just run into it full speed with your chassis, boom, knock it down the field. So there's going to be a lot of doggy go fetch to play, and yeah. it's defense can be rather effective. Uh, one thing I think we'll see a lot of is, is that um, the effects of defense won't be too pronounced during qualification rounds, because I think in qualifying rounds, teams are still busy working on their own scoring mechanisms, yeah. their own passing mechanisms. But you get to the elimination rounds where, <coughs> you know, like, you're facing off against, like, the number one, two, or three alliance who has, you know, two really great scoring robots, mm -hmm. and they're going to get defended hardcore, because... In the ELIMS, you're not trying to show off for everyone. You're just trying to do what it takes to win. And uh, it's the same thing we've seen, we saw in 2007 when defense really stepped up in the ELIMS. So I'm, I'm worried. I shouldn't say worried, but um, 
I just I don't think defensive games are the most attractive for the audience. So yeah, I am worried for the audience that it may get yeah. it may not be this free flowing passing game that you know if you know for you know this is the first Canada webinar. So if you think about it in hockey terms, I think the elimination rounds could end up being a lot of uh, a big giant neutral zone crap hmm. where teams are just you know keeping the balls in the in the mid zone and just preventing any scoring from happening. I, I'm very excited about the, just the potential match strategies and just how many there are um, in this game and how many we'll see. Uh, I'm just really excited to see what teams come up with and what and how teams uh, go about um, you know, doing that. I wonder, like, I don't know if it's, it's obviously way in the future, but I wonder if any off-season events will, will allow two walls or, you know, or all three, you know, or something. That, We'll have to see how it goes. I right? see what you're saying, right? Or any, I mean, any off-season event. Could, uh, could yeah, I love how you guys are proposing rule changes for the game that none of us have seen played yet. We would never do that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I say. I, a lot of it depends on, you know, because one ball, you know, might be more than enough or whatever. But <clears> well, be. guys, don't worry. I, I know I read this on Chief Delphi, and there's going to be a secret <laughs> endgame with the championship. A secret endgame. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll be on the we, we I know we're saving weight on, on 340. We're saving yeah. weight for this. We're going to prototype some trust, uh, trust hanging mechanism. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the cooperation trust. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I mean, we like you said, we talked at length about defense, and we're just really going to see what it goes and what goes on. So, um, so kind of, do you have any, you know, do you have a high score prediction, or do you think, you know, um, what do you think maybe the max score we'll see um, in aerial assist, whether it be eliminations or or uh, Einstein or what? Uh, I don't have a necessary prediction. I think I can say that um, in terms of scoring trends, I think that early on we're going to see a lot of um, cycles without assists. I think we're going to see the kind of matches where one team will shotgun it and he would trust toss, pick it up themselves, and then score it. So we'll be seeing a lot of those kind of... Um, uh, 30 po 20 point cycles that way. I think um, as you go along, the most successful alliances are going to be the cohesive ones who move past the shotgun strategy and start working for those triple assists. Um, the, those points really, really add up. I think we saw a lot of it in uh, a basketball game. I, I just don't remember the yeah, names, remember. but <laughs> where. You know, there was a lot of alliances which were just kind of like, okay, we're just going to score as many points as we can, and you know, we'll deal with balancing whatever. And those alliances were getting upset by teams three competent uh, long body robots that could do a triple balance cause, and just get that massive uh, score injection. So if a team can do like two or three um, triple assist uh, uh, cycles, that could that can be pretty overwhelming to you know teams who are trying to do you know that shotgun where two teams are taking turns cycling. So um, I think scores will start low, but I think scores will improve uh, drastically because I mean, and we talked about it earlier. Assists are so much easier than anyone realizes. Yeah, <clears throat> like people are missing one of these key definitions. I, I don't have my manual like right in front of me. I don't want to like go to the uh, the website right now, but Trapping is considered a form of possession. So for those of you who haven't read the rules or haven't really read rules in a detailed way, if you are to overtly isolate a ball, that is considered possession. So, and they even say in the rules, um, uh, I, you know, pressing it up against the field. So if you can take a ball, so if you're a robot that has no functionality except the drive train, my, uh, this is just my interpretation of the rules. Someone can Q&A it and see what they think. If you drive into a ball and push it up against the side of the field, and that's the first time that ball's been possessed in that zone by your robot, ding, 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 that's an assist. So think about how easy it is to get an assist. Robot A, human loads the, the ball from the human player in um, the red zone. Ding, assist number one. Not worth anything because it's assist number one. Robot A then drives to the white zone and releases the ball nearby the field perimeter. Robot B then in the white zone drives into the ball and pushes at it for like a second or two to isolate it. I don't know how long you have to do it for, but let's just say a second. They then drive off. Mm -hmm. That's assist number two, ding. And then robot number three comes in, picks up the ball in the white zone, 
drives to the blue zone, ding, assist number three. <clears throat> That's an assist number three without any real active sort of mechanisms, you know, other than just, like, oh, that's not true, because it, it's requiring a robot to have a pick, one robot to have a pickup, and one robot having the ability to spit a ball out they got from the human player. But it's the coordination thing. That's the actual hard part, the coordination between the alliance. So, I mean, the most, the easiest assists are going to be the ones that, you know, um, uh, we like to call robot makeout. Um, <laughs> some people on the call would call it the A bomb, 2006, where two robots go mouth to mouth, and one spits the ball into the other one's mouth because mm -hmm. that one can't be. Inter it's harder to interfere with defense, that, yeah. but assists it could be easier than we think. Now, I'm not sure if the intent of the rule was to allow people to push balls into the corner and get an assist for it, but. No one's asked a Q&A about it yet, so I guess everyone seems to think that's what it is. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I, if, I had to, if I had to guess, I would say that certainly was not their intent, <laughs> but I think that they made a huge mistake. I know we're being super critical of the GDC, but I don't really care. I'm so, not being critical. I, 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 I don't try and evaluate their intent. <laughs> I just read the words that they give to me. The words they give to me is that trappings, and, you know, that's possession. So uh, right. as far as I'm concerned, that, if, if yeah. they change it, then they change it. That's fine, too. I just, I guess, I just don't like that they only talked about the possession as far as what you could do to the other team's robot or the other team's ball, and I think they sh should have, you know, addressed the assists a little bit more because I just think that two two problems with it. The one is trapping it against the wall, counting as a assist, is going to be very, very confusing to the average, um, uh, you know, just the general watcher of the event, the audience. And then, secondly, I think it's going to be up to the referees and. It's a judgment call to define, well, oh, how long did they trap it? You know, all sorts of stuff. It's just going to be, oh, <laughs> the line to the I question mean, box is going to get long. If I was a person who wrote robotics game rules for a living, um, <laughs> I would have defined two terms. I would have defined possession, which deals with possessing uh, a uh, ball of your own color. And I would have dealt with obstruction, which deals mm. with interactions with a ball of the opposite color. And the definitions of possession and obstruction would have been uh, different. I would not have defined um, trapping a ball into the corner as possession, but I definitely would have described it as obstruction. And yeah. in that way, with having those varying definitions, you could have uh, a sliding scale criteria. But that's neither here nor there. Because hmm. I, I think right now what's important for teams is teams to look at G12, read through that very carefully, look at the glossary for the definition of possession, and find out what they need to do to possess the ball and what they need to do to record and assist and mm -hmm. make sure that when they're designing their robot they have some functionality to do that because the game is called aerial assist and if you want to be a successful part of an alliance on Saturdays you will need to be doing some assisting. You may be doing some defense, you may be doing some scoring, but the triple assist is key, and that means all three teams have to be able to perform an assist. But that assist may not be as hard as everyone thinks. I think that's great, and I think you know I was I had that in my mind too. Just maybe some inconsistencies amongst reference crews. Yeah, you know, just how different reference crews will see it. But I think it's great because we have a lot of teams on on the call tonight. Just maybe you know it's been a while since you looked at your manual. It's never a bad idea to go through it and read it again. And uh, not that you miss anything, but just to keep you refreshed and, um, you know, up to date and all that. So. Yeah, I mean, even in, especially the team updates, right? Like the, the update about if a ball gets stuck in your robot, you can signal to the head ref and get a new ball. Like that's, that's game changing. If you haven't read the rules since kickoff and you're not aware of that, you know, that's something that's really important. Yeah. It's quite, uh, quite big. Open up your browser. <laughs> FRC link slash D. <laughs> FRClinks.com slash D. Thanks, Pat Fairbank. <laughs> All right, so um, Sean asked another question, and it kind of goes um, into what we were talking about a little bit before, but he asked, how do you plan to objectively, quantitatively um, scout aerial assist, and how important is, you know, and like we've mentioned before, just having a system that is um, very accurate to what happened in the match is crucial for scouting later that night, and uh, well, just to know exactly what robot did what. I think it's important. I, I always say you want to scout quantitative things. So the easy things to scout are 
How many times did they score in the low goal? How many times did they attempt to score in the low goal? How many shots did they take in the high goal? How many times did they go in? You know, how many times did they throw it over the truss? How many times did they catch it? How many times did they miss when they were catching? That stuff's easy. What about assists? Assists are not necessarily the easiest things to do, and assists also are context dependent. Because, for example, if team A passes, you know, takes the ball and then puts it right into team B, but then they never score from that cycle, well, shouldn't your you still recognize that team team A did this? This is a big thing that actually comes up in the NBA um, in terms of um, some of the metrics that they're looking at right now, because. In the NBA, um, and this was like the curse of poor LeBron James when he was playing in Cleveland, where he would make magical pass after magical pass, and then like Booby Gibson and all these other morons in Cleveland would miss the shot, and it, it did nothing for LeBron's stat line. But those like um, advanced statisticians in the NBA were not just looking at pure assists; they were also looking at assist opportunities. How many open shots did they create, and what? Um, what did those assists lead to, and just kind of looking at the back end of it. So one thing I'd be looking at more than um, did Team A, how many assists did they get that match, is how many unique times did they take possession of a ball, and how many unique times did they release possession of the ball. Hmm. And how many zones did they travel between when changing possession of the ball. That Just looking at instances of possession and non-possession, as opposed to assist and non-assist, is just like a very easy way to keep things uh, intelligent. I think it kind of relates back to 2012 where um, picking for nominations, uh, a lot of thought went into, you know, size of the robot, how good their intake was, but maybe not for their intake, but to let them out um, during autonomous to feed them to somebody else. And I think it's all this, all this scouting is going to be huge um, when, you, when you go to, to pick for that. That um, for the eliminations, especially now at championship, when you can pick four, or you can pick have four teams in the lines. Yeah, I think it's going to be important for teams to, especially the way this game is set up. It's I think maybe you'll see it more where teams aren't picking necessarily the best of the robot at the event or one of the best high goal scores. They're going to pick the robot that fits best with their, you know, the assist progression. Uh, two dominating high goal scores aren't necessarily the best plan for an eliminations lines. So I think that might uh, might actually make the elimination rounds pretty exciting if there's, um, you know, teams are planning more for the the triple assist instead of the the dominating well, score barrage. Well, if if you think about last year, um, a lot of alliances were simply formed with. I mean, the World Champion Alliance was it was very simple: get the three best cyclers on the alliance and just cycle everyone to death. And in a lot of games, it's been that way. But this year, I mean, if you already have two high goal scorers on your alliance. Do you need that third one, or would you rather focus on a robot with a wicked ground pickup? Mm -hmm. Or if you, if the number one seed is a wicked high goal scoring robot, is your first pick going to be another high goal scorer? Sure, having the versatility of having two high goal scorers is great because then you can do a lot of different in match strategies and they can't key on the one scorer. But maybe the next, the first pick is going to be a pure catching robot because they want to get that ten points every cycle. So uh, there will be a lot of dynamic alliance selections, and I think this will be one year where um, everyone's pick lists are going to look very different based on Absolutely. the type of robot they have. Yep. And I think it's going to be one year where the teams who um, stupidly only make their pick list based on OPR are going to struggle. <laughs> yeah, this is from Lexi. Um, she says, could you hit the other team's ball without possessing it? Um, say if you wound up your launcher without your ball and use the well-timed release to hit the other team's ball. Uh, I was just, I was just going to invite Lexi, invite Lexi, Lexi to, to add to the question. To the question. Oh, great. Oh, great. I think perhaps sometimes uh, the audience are gone for a break and they're not sure their questions are going to be answered or asked. So go ahead, Justin and Mike. I apologize about that. Oh, sure, no problem. Do, do, do. So, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we have someone in the audience raising their hand. Sure. So I'll unmute them, Kevin. You can speak. 
Kevin, go ahead. Okay, so he typed in the question. So. So well, Kevin is shy. He typed in a question. All right. So the question is, um, Windsor, Ontario. Rookies, we are going with the easiest we can. Assist small team just trying to get there. Can we just bounce the ball off our bot, off the barrier to the next zone, and the other teammate chases it down, assist? You, um, one of the things they ruled today or on Friday was that um, simple deflection. So the rope. Let me get the wording. I want to get this right. Yeah, was it in the update? Yeah, it was in the update. Um, let me just go. FRCU update. I think it was on the update on the 17th. Yeah. So launching impelling balls to a desired location or direction by a mechanism in motion relative to the robot. So just having a ball bounce off your robot, that's not motion. There's no mechanism in motion relative to a robot. So just simply bouncing it off your robot or simply driving into a ball and knocking it to the next zone wouldn't necessarily qualify for possession and hence wouldn't be part of an assist. It would kind of like you would have to have something in motion on your robot, like an arm that hits the ball and knocks it away. So Mike and Justin, is that your understanding of the rule? Yeah, definitely. And I think it touches on Lexi's question as well. Can you hit the ball um, with a, a launcher with a ball time shot? I think before it seemed to be that um, you, you couldn't. Um, but now since you especially describe it as using your launcher to move, to launch the ball, uh, the team update says via a mechanism motion relative to the robot. So if you did that to your own ball, it's an assist. If you did that to your opponent's ball, uh, you're going to be penalized for that. And then to, to Kevin's point, um, if you just simply built a robot and you're hoping the human player can just bounce the ball off of it, uh, I don't think that's going to count as an assist. <coughs> mm -hmm. Good questions, though. Oh, we got a whole bunch of them. Um, uh, uh, here's a really good question. Uh, it's the question of the century. Um, at what point does herding count as possession? Um, I would say ask it on the Q&A, but if you ask that on the Q&A, they would just tell you to read the rules. So um, let's try and be helpful here. Um, so in terms of possession, here's the definition of possession. There's four possible criteria for possession. Carrying, moving while supporting balls in or on the robot. That means, you know, like carrying in terms of like the dictionary definition. It is in your robot, you're holding it, you're moving, the ball's moving with you. Hurting repeated pushing or bumping. So this is a hard one because that's all that we've been given in terms of information, that hurting is repeated pushing or bumping. I mean, to me, repeated means at least twice, so you have to push it twice for it to be mm -hmm. hurting. I mean, I think the common sense interpretation is if you think about um, the hockey example of stick handling, that you kind of controlled it for a certain period of time and you moved with it. But, I, I mean, Andrew, I wish we could give you a better answer, but based on what we see there, I think, you know, hurting is when you have pushed the ball, when you have pushed the ball along the ground and it has traveled some distance along with your robot. I mean, that would be my interpretation. I am not a referee, I'm just an MC. So, I, I, <laughs> I mean, take that for what it's worth. Mike and Justin, what do you think? No. <laughs> 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 Jeez. So I was actually uh, looking at some stuff in the Q and A. Um, no, I have no, no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I, don't have any, I think. Yeah. I think you gotta. And uh, the hurting, like you said, the repeated. Because I was just looking at that too. Yeah. The repeated, I think, mean yeah, more than once. And yeah. Like the way I just read it, and I gotta find it because I was just I was actually looking for the answer to Brad's question is why I didn't exactly hear everything that Karthik said, but um, the repeated, the G12B hurting is repeated pushing or bumping, repeated pushing, like I think, you know, you're trying to get that, whether that's, you're just trying, you're pushing it yourself repeatedly, um, not 
try to get to the local, to the other end of the field, whatever it may be, um, not just more than once or whatever. I just don't like instances where the referee has to make a decision <laughs> at all. Um, and this is going to be one of them, unfortunately. So Brad's question was, can we be partially in the goal zone and block the low goal by reaching an arm out in front of the low goal? Um, G26-1 um, which was an update. Um, there really, there originally wasn't anything in the rules that said you couldn't do that, um, but there was a team update that came out that says G26-1. Robots may not break the planes of the openings of the opponent's low goals. The violation is a foul. If, it's ex is, if extended, strategic, or repeated, it's a tech foul. So you can't do that. Now, well, now whether you sit in front of it and yeah. put something out, as long as it's not doesn't break the plane of the goal, but as long as you don't do that and you can sit in front of it or whatever, that is totally fine. You do so you can go in front to play with. You could go in front of the goal, you just can't yep. go in the goal. So you could Absolutely. just put your put your robot in front of the goal and block it yep. there. Now remember there are multiple openings to that goal, but uh, low goal defense is a very viable strategy. Whether you know you could take down the front and the side opening, you could you know you have that twenty inches to play with um, on either you know either side. So if you sat on one edge and maybe did like a right angle sort of thing, that'd be kind of interesting. Uh, you might be able to take down, um, you know, kill two birds with one stone, stone so to speak. Um, speaking of breaking the plane, um, I think one thing that I really want teams to be very well aware of is uh, G21. And let me just get to it in the manual. Mike and Justin, if you get to it before me, just jump in. G21 is. Uh... Robots may not extend outside the field, a foul if continuous or repeated violations, technical foul if contact with any outside field, red card, and the robot will be disabled. So G21. If, you, if you think back to past years, um, having part of your robot break the plane of the field was not a penalty. It was only a penalty once you touched down onto the ground outside the field. Um, in 2012, it happened a lot. Robots were hovering or hanging on the bridge, and their arm would just kind of be uh, waving over. Uh, at 2012 in GTR West, we actually saw a team drive off the field completely. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. But this year, lots of teams are going to have these 20-inch appendages mm -hmm. that go outside their frame perimeter for ball pickup. And you might be trying to pick up a ball that's pressed up against the wall, and you might slightly break the plane of the field. That, by the letter of the law, is a 20-point penalty. So, yeah, it's um, that's a tough one. So we it's very a, important for teams to be very careful when they're coming to the uh, field border. Absolutely. And Justin and I kind of had this conversation, I don't know when, a few couple weeks ago. Or it has to be less than a couple weeks ago. Yeah. But, um, you know, just some teams having, like you said, the appendages, is 20-inch on either side, maybe one robots that are catching. I was like, you know what, a great place to be for catching would be right against the barrier, right against the side of the field, because nobody can, you know, really, you're, you have one less side people can push you on, actually two less sides people can push you on, and it, just things will work out better. But of course, this rule kind of negates that, you know, that philosophy and that sort of line of thinking that that may be a good place to, to catch a ball. Um, and these 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 penalties can really add up and be detrimental to a to a team. So especially with I think uh, we saw it a lot in 2006, saw a lot in 2009. A lot of teams use the side of the field to aid in getting that ball. In 2008, another example. You know that the pinching against the wall is you know vital to some teams some teams pick up. And you know if you come out and over that ball, you know you gotta you gotta be really be careful. Yeah. So going back to we're talking about goalies, um, kind of near the top of the show. So since they added that that change to the mechanism and the deflecting launching rule, so the way I read it and the way this Q and A seems to confirm is now that if you're a goalie, right? So say you have a, a six-inch cylinder that you can zip back and forth pretty quickly. If you're zipping it over, you're moving it over to try to block a shot, and it's in motion when the when the opponent's ball passes in front of it, so you hit it, that's a penalty on the goalie for launching the ball via a mechanism. Hmm. So that's just, that seems very strange to me. So any goalie that wants to stop a shot has to make sure their mechanism is stopped so it's a deflection and not an active swipe. So it makes it a little harder to be a goalie. 
Well, I, I'm not sure it makes it that much harder, because I'm thinking if I was to be a goalie, I would just want something static and stiff up there for the ball to deflect off of. I wouldn't want to have it be active in any way. I mean, it's kind of like how it's easier to bunt with a stationary bat as opposed to hitting a ball when you're swinging it. So I, 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 I can see that, but I, I don't think that's going to be the biggest um, obstacle to being a goalie, that's for sure. Yeah. I think if I was to do it, I would have a, you know, my 20 inches extend out each side. I have a nice long robot, so I have 72 inches essentially of a really fast linear actuator and try to block all, all 11 feet as quickly as I could with a, some sort of fast motion. But, that, that's a very fast motion. Yeah. Trying to, Dylan asked the question, couldn't that same bot that traps the ball against the wall hurt the ball by that definition? I mean, kind of, like, hurting is repeated pushing or bumping, so, I mean, yeah, you could, trapping and hurting could end up being the same thing if you just ram the ball into the wall five times, that's both hurting and trapping, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, G12, I mean, G12 talks about doing it with your opponent's ball, but the criteria of possession in the glossary is the, is the same thing coming from G12. It's uh, possession is not as difficult as it seems to be. So I, um, John, I see that Sean has his hand raised, and and the questions he has his mic now, um, so he has a question about OPR. All right, we're going to give Sean an opportunity. Sean, go ahead. Hi, this is Sean from seventeen twelve. Sorry for kind of monopolizing the questions here. Um, <laughs> but if defense is as sporadic as a lot of us think it is, might this year finally be a year where OPR is valuable given the alliance-based scoring structures? Uh, absolutely, because um, I mean, w when you know we started trying to use uh, OPR before we, it was even called OPR in eleven fourteen. One of the things we were trying we where we came out of was on um, basketball statistics. Where we were trying, where in the NBA with adjusted plus minus, which is like the forebear to OPR, they were trying to figure out the value of a player who is on the court and is touching the ball but isn't actually doing the scoring, and trying to see you know how much they were contributing to the the score differential. This year, where um, it may be difficult to record assists. I record assists as in like the scouting method of recording assists. OPR could be very useful. If there's a team who's just really good at facilitating assists, they should have a higher OPR because their aligned scores should be higher on average. And as such, um, you may be able to pluck it out. So I think there is some potential for OPR there. The, the flip side of it is that um, OPR, the best year for OPR was 2008, where defense was very, very difficult. And even when you defense was able to be played on a team, um, the penalty for um, uh, the um, you know the inter hurdle or interference penalty also just kind of bled into OPR. So I, I think this year's game, there's the possibility of OPR being very strong, but um, in the matches where defense becomes a huge effect, uh, you might be wanting to look at the OPR in terms of as opposed to the offensive rating, but looking at the uh, point differential maybe. Uh, I have higher op I have more faith in OPR this year than I did in like 2012 for sure and 2011 because of the mini ball weirdness. But I think it's probably around the same ballpark as this year. What do you think, Sean? Sean, still can we unmute Sean again? Absolutely. Uh, there we go. Go ahead, Sean. Oh, a I mean, my biggest concern is still going to be sample size, I especially too. outside of districts, um, where not enough teams are going to play 10 plus matches to really normalize the OPR. That's my biggest concern with OPR in almost any year. Well, yeah, OPR is always going to be um, a victim of sample size, and I think that any team who tries to use OPR for in event scouting is doing it wrong because you're at the event, you should be able to watch the matches, you shouldn't be using OPR. But I think that, I mean, as more regions go to districts when teams are coming to the championship who you know, played upwards of 40 to 50 matches, it makes any sort of um, statistic like that more useful. So I guess there's that benefit as there's um, two regions popping into districts this year, so there's a bit more of a sample size. Um, and Sean, do you want to... Oh, go ahead, Carthage. 
Uh, I just saw another question in here that um, that's an easy one for us to answer. If a robot is able to throw the ball over the truss and catch it themselves, does it count as 20 points? No, it does not. Um, the definition of a catch requires that a catch occurs uh, when a ball is scored over the truss by a robot's alliance partner is then possessed by that robot before contact the carpet or the robot which scored the truss. So basically what that rule is saying is the robot who scores the truss cannot get credit for the catch. They can still catch the ball, but you aren't going to get 10 points for the catch. I mean, but there still is benefit to doing that, you know, because the, you know, the ball is not now in the field of play somewhere. You can get your truss points, but still have possession of your ball. You're not, you're not chasing it down and, and then have to do something with it. Um, another question I've seen here, and there are a lot of hyphens in this question, but um, next question, thanks, spelled with an X. Um, don't know why you would do that. Thanks, guys. Possession is mine. Blocker in front of me. Propel beach ball, LOL, off barrier. Uh, what I'm bringing. Um, to partner next zone assist. Okay, let's go over assist. An assist happens when a unique robot takes possession of the ball in it. So, sorry, let me back up here. An assist happens where a robot who has not recorded an assist yet takes possession of a ball in a zone where no assist happens. How the ball gets there is irrelevant. Who sends them the ball, whatever, it's all irrelevant. So an assist, all that you need for an assist is a robot who hasn't recorded an assist yet gets possession of the ball in a zone where an assist has not been recorded. So in the uh, scenario that Kevin proposed, as long as the partner who's in the next zone has never had recorded an assist during that cycle, and the ball is now being possession is taken in a zone where an assist hasn't happened, that's an assist. It doesn't matter how it gets there. It doesn't matter if you swing it with a baseball bat. It doesn't matter if your robot does a bicycle kick like Pele. It just it doesn't matter how the ball gets there. <laughs> unique robot, unique zone, possession, assist. I, I mean, we talked about this at Build Blitz a lot. I, I know, you know, sorry, Mike and Justin, you guys have to listen to my rants about this. But <laughs> when you call the game aerial assist, everyone, well, I mean, everyone who watches sports, which I guess in first is like no one, which drives me crazy, but um, is an assist. You think of the hockey assist. You think of the basketball assist. Hockey assist from tape. From stick to stick to net, basketball assist from hand to hand with a one to two steps, and in, or, or seven steps like the way. <laughs> but here, uh, the ball can roll into the zone. No one can touch it for a whole minute. The opponent can play around with it. It can knock it back three zones, whatever. It can bounce around, and then someone just goes and holds it for two seconds. That's an assist. So assists. Don't aren't necessarily the sporting convention of an assist. I know. As somebody who's going to be scouting or hovering a scout, like it's something I really need to, you know, dive in and understand to every extent. And for drivers behind the glass, like you know, it, with that screen that's going to be back there, understanding that. I mean, they give some examples in the in the manual, but um, it'd be nice to see maybe how those change on the fly like, a little bit. Well, like if they did a simulated one, they could release that you know, for a field, field tour or something. Field tour did a good job of that. <clears throat> well, and I I'm think this, this year's yeah. game is going to be um, maybe the most challenging on a coach since 2007. Um, for those who aren't familiar with 2007, the scoring structure was a, a giant cylinder in the middle of the field known as the rack, and they had like 24 scoring spots all around it, and you had to keep track of the real-time scorer you know, pretty much yourself, where you couldn't see things on the other side of the field, and to uh, throw things in, the scoring was exponentially based on the length of your rows. So like, that was like a crazy one for coaches to deal with. Um, this year, the assist is something that's hard to see, that is hard to see. You have those screens above, but I mean, I don't know any coaches who like taking their eyes off the field. So that heads-up display, depending on where that's exactly positioned, it's going to be hard to be watching the match and focusing on that. Um, there was a question in there for Peter Moore about the importance of human players. Um, human players have an important job in returning balls to the field, 
but I mean they're also an extra set of eyes on the field who can let you know what's going on and can make signals to you when they've seen things. So it's uh, using your human player as a conduit for information is a very smart strategy. Has there been any update or Q&A about the start of human players and if all three could be in the Alliance station or is, there, is it mandated that there has to be one in each, in each zone? Has that been clarified yet? Every uh, hybrid says they can be any, you can have any combination in any zone. You, don't have to, you need one in your alliance zone as far as more than one. I haven't heard anything about that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not too familiar, so I can't comment. So that as it stands, you mind. know, you could, you know, all three alliances could have their extra, not extra, but their human player, you know, be a human player and the secondary coach to watch things like that. All right. What else do you guys have on your agenda? We've covered a lot of it. Just about just does to, it. Just to the questions, have we talked about a lot of what we um, what we wanted to go over? I'm, I'm going to allow Peter Moore to ask another question. He's just posed one, so Peter, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I also do game announcing. I'm doing five competitions this year, and I'm working on phrases and descriptions for actions on the field. And I like what Karthik mentioned: uh, "Doggy, go fetch," and <laughs> "Catching blanket." And, of um, course, there's, there's goalie bot, and uh, my personal favorite is dung needle. Do you guys have any other clever phrases or descriptions for games or actions on the field this year? Uh, well, question. one phrase that I'm a big fan of is not just the catching blanket, but the magic blanket, when a team just kind of expands and magically catches the ball. Like, I, I, I'm all about the magic blanket, so I think, you know, that's a big one. I mean, it's a game played with balls, so balls so hard. That's one that we're going to be using up in Waterloo and up here in Canada for sure. That one's kind of common. I mean, you you kind of want to, uh, I mean, tie in with a sporting aspect. I mean, if you look at the all the stuff they were talking about with the game hint, they were talking about John Stockton, Wayne Gretzky. So you, there's all sorts of neat sports references you can throw in. Um, the big hockey reference is the beautiful tape to tape pass. You know, that's when you know it goes exactly from one person's stick to the other. So there's that. Um, robot makeout is a term that I like to use when two robots go kind of mouth to mouth and if one sends the ball into the other like they're kissing. So you know, there, there, there's that. I mean, Peter, you do the you do the game announcing in the Northeast. I mean, you've been doing this for a while, so I'm sure you've got some good stuff up there, right? Uh, no, the best one I came up with so far was dung beetle. Yeah, well. I'm sure we're going to have a webinar with um, Blair Hundermark soon for all of us MCs and game announcers, so I'm sure he's got some stuff for us too. But I, I think it will just naturally evolve. I remember last year um, I was at Finger Lakes MC on the Saturday, and there was just a match with a couple full-court shooters who were just launching them down there. And I was just like, they're firing them like laser beams. And it was just like, you know, the, the laser beams and the missiles, just it was something that kind of came about. I don't think anything will ever top a well-hung Uber tube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no comment. <laughs> don't get fired. Don't get fired. Don't get fired. That was, yeah. really that was the mantra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Karthik. So it's now week three. Uh, you know, there might be, I know there's a lot of, this, these calls are specifically kind of catered towards helping teams and especially rookie teams. So it's week three. If a team's feeling overwhelmed, what are some simple tasks that they should be focusing on at this point to kind of either get themselves back on track or if something's not working, at what point do you say, all right, let's focus on something else or let's start getting simpler? What, what advice do you have for teams right now? Well, I always say um, you start, as time goes on and you're, you know, you're coming down to the crunch, you need to start eliminating things off your priority list. You always eliminate from the bottom, which is usually where the harder tasks are. You want to make sure you nail the things up top. So you've got to make sure you dr can drive. You've got to make sure that you can eject the robot. I mean, if it's week three and I have a team and I've got to figure out what I'm doing, the first thing I want to do is get my drivetrain working with an autonomous mode that can drive a straight line forward right to the logo and then have some sort of way of releasing that ball into the logo. If you can consistently score a ball in autonomous period, you are a huge value to an alliance just by not becoming a hindrance to the alliance. I'd rather take that team that just scores that logo into the scores that ball into the logo 
over a team who's even a seven, just a 70% high goal shooter because that risk that 30% of the time when they're going to miss is, oh, God, well, now we're slowed down and we might lose one, two cycles because of that. It's, so the ability to um, receive a ball from a human player, the ability to eject the ball in some sort of controlled way either into a goal or into a partner or an assist, and having a pickup, so if a ball gets left there on the ground, you can then possess it and move it somewhere else. Those are the sorts of things to be focusing on. I know everyone's going to be like, oh, let's look at those robots in three days. There are five robots. They can all score on the high goal. As much as those experts made it look easy, it still was difficult. Yeah. I mean, remember who was leading these teams, like Paul Copioli, John V. Noon, um, uh, Joe Johnson, Dan Richardson, like these guys, AJ, Anthony Lapp, these guys are really, really good at robots. So just because you know, they did it in three days doesn't necessarily mean you you can, nor does it mean you should, because there's so much, I mean, the jack of all trades is the master of none, and I'd rather have someone who does a lower rated function at 9 out of 10 than a higher rated function of 5 out of 10. I don't, you know, like, an average high goal scorer is not necessarily as useful as a ridiculously awesome passing and low goal scoring robot. So, I, I mean, focus on the simple stuff. So, so Karthik, uh, uh, John. yeah, excuse me, uh, let me ask, and you partly answered this question already. Um, at this point of the season, could you describe for the audience what you would consider a good first pick and then what a second pick might be? I mean, I can't really, it, it's hard, to, it's like what we were saying earlier, John, it's just that this year pick lists are so much going to be dependent on what the picking team can do themselves. Like last year, it would have been very easy to say, I want Frisbee scoring robots, I'd love to have one of them who can hang, one of them with a floor pickup, but really I just want robots that can score the most Frisbees. Um, this year... It, it, it really depends. Like, if the number one pick is, sorry, it's a, if the team who's picking is a low goal scoring robot, then yeah, I want a high goal score. If it is a high goal scoring robot, my first, the, they might say, I want to have a catcher that I can do trust tosses to, and then grab a wicked passing robot with the next pick. So it's, it's all about filling out what you don't have. So, or if you're the picker, you have to look at what role on the alliance do you want to fulfill? Once you figure that out, then you want two alliance partners who can fulfill the other roles. The roles that you're looking at that are pretty distinct are, you know, scorer, passer, catcher. Like that, that could be the alliance right there, scorer, passer, catcher. So you're trying to fill those three spots. Now, that being said, catchy might just be so difficult that it's just not important to have a catcher. So you might want to have scorer, scorer, passer. You might just think that, wait a second, what if I just go three passers who are all wicked passers, no one scores in the high goal, and we're just going to be trying to put up 51, um, sorry, 40, 31 point cycles with triple assist and uh, one point goal, and just do as many 31 point cycles as you can. That might be more valuable than trying to do um, 60 point cycles, which can't be done as quickly. I don't know. So it's all about looking at the skills that your robot has and finding out what gaps you need filled on the alliance. Great. What do you guys think, Mike and Justin? Go ahead. Yeah, I think it, you nailed it. I think it's, uh, it's going to be really important for teams to understand what the robot is good at and, more importantly, what the robot is not good at and then find the, the other or the next best team at the event that can fulfill that role that you're really looking for. Um, you have to play it against your your um, uh, potential other alliances, and it's very uh, it's going to be a very dynamic alliance selection, so make sure that your field person is pretty uh, – well versed in, in how all that could go down because those cho those choices that you make are ultimately what wins you or loses the events. So, you know, I said earlier, like I'm really looking forward to seeing what what teams end up going for, you know, and <laughs> the talk amongst teams as maybe teams higher than you or lower than you at that point start taking robots on their way back up and then maybe, like you said, Karthik, those pick lists are just going to be drastically different and have multiple layers to them this year and different columns and, and robots and and rankings, and it's going to be quite interesting. I know, like, a championship, Red gets last move, Red, Red Alliance gets last move? No, um, in the qualification rounds, the uh, Red Alliance gets last move. 
in the elimination rounds, the higher seed of the Lions gets last move. This isn't okay. Mm -hmm. Which isn't um, necessarily the Red Alliance, because you know, like for example, if the number eight Alliance beats the number one Alliance. Um, number eight would be the Red Alliance versus number four, but number four is actually the higher seeded Alliance. Okay, hmm. so I was wondering if that translates to uh, robot placement, because in eliminations at championship, you have four robots. So could you yep, put two it, it out gets, there, and then based on who they like, what robot they put on the field, could you like switch up your strategy almost, and then put. You know, if you have a, a vast, you know, drastically different robot as your fourth robot, mm, it's really know, interesting. Could you, could you like kind of wait to see who they put on the field, and then you can kind of throw a curveball at them at the very end? I don't know. I, I mean, I, if you go back to the last time first had uh, multi-team alliances where someone was sitting out, that's the way it was. Um, they did have some sort of preference, and if you look at how IRI does it, the higher seeded alliance does get preference. So since they're adopting the IRI rule for championship line selection, I would assume it's the same thing because. They're saying that you have to, um, that the higher seed alliance gets precedence for placement of the robot. So I would assume that placement also includes your declaration of yeah. the robots. But that's probably a good Q&A question. Yeah. I did see, I forget now what exactly rule it was, what number, but in eliminations, you are, your fourth alliance that is not on the field, you are allowed to put somebody in the alliance station. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I, I think, really awesome. So we kind of you hit on it a little bit um, a question or two ago, but if your team if there is maybe a team that we talked about it a little bit at at Build Blitz, but if there's a team you're on an alliance qualifications whatever, I guess mostly qualifications. Um, and there's a team that is you know better than you or could use the ball more efficiently than you. Um, how do you see that playing out amongst discussions, or you know, do you think we'll see the humility amongst teams to maybe sacrifice their ball in autonomous, or be willing to say, you know what, we'll let you be our primary scorer for this match? And how do you, you know, how do you see that playing out? <laughs> I, it, it's such a hard one because I mean, you've got to look at it. Um, when you play a match, you're in an alliance, and you would think that gracious professionalism dictates that you should always be doing what's best for the alliance. But what's best for the alliance isn't necessarily what's best for the individual team. Uh, it, let's just lay it out there. Um, my opinion as a strategist, I'm always going to do what's best for the alliance to get the win. Period. That's uh, our team's philosophy. Um, you know, if it, you need us to play defense, then we're going to go play defense. Um, you need us to be the goalie. We'll play. We'll, we'll, you know, put a goalie device on our robot. You want us to be the catcher? We'll be the catcher. I, you know, it is what it is. It's to do the best thing for the alliance. Now, a lot of teams feel that that shouldn't matter. That they need to do what's best for them. And maybe winning the match isn't as important for a team as showcasing their ability as a high, be the high goal scorer. That is a difficult thing to reconcile. Period. But it's. It's always been a difficult thing in games where you know the best strategy for a team might be to play defense, but they'd rather go score. It comes up every year. This year it becomes even more difficult because um, there's only one ball. So if you know team 77-77 decides, hey, I'm scoring this match even if it's not the best thing for the Lions because I need to show people that I can score. That's bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you're suddenly fighting over a ball that you can't be fighting over and the most cohesive alliances are going to be the ones where the ball flows through the alliance naturally and if your two teams are fighting over a ball it, I mean even in 2008 um, there were some elimination matches where teams two partners would fight over the same ball for, for no real reason just because they wanted to cycle faster and uh, it ended up hurting alliances so that's a difficult one I think as the season evolves um, you think you'd be better at it but it's Saturday morning where those things get ugly because, mm -hmm. you know, your last chance, again, show it day. <clears throat> team 77-77 might be told by a team, you know, 55-55, hey, we need to, if you can show us that you can score three balls in the high goal this match, we're going to pick you. While yep. their partner might be in the, their last qualifying match of the day, might be the number 10 seed. It says, if we win this match, we're going to move up to number eight. 
And the best way for us to win this match is for you to focus on simple assists to us, because then we can do triple assists. And that's a hard thing to settle. And yeah. uh, I, I mean, a lot of it comes into um, you know doing doing what's best for the alliance. It's just there's some interesting dynamics there, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But I, I mean, at the end of the day, like we're presented with a goal, which is to win matches, and I, I think that's what we should be trying to do. But it's yeah, yeah, it's up to each team's own philosophy. So uh, a quick comment on how I guess that what can help that situation is last year on on our team, uh, I had a tablet for all my strategy discussions, and that tablet was being fed with real time scouting data from the field or from from our scouters. <coughs> so when it came time to decide for strategy, it was much easier for me to tell an alliance. Um, kind of what they might be good at if I had some quanti you know, some, you know, some quantitative data to back that up. It's hard for me to. It's hard for a team to say, you know what, we really want you to do this because you haven't been good at it. It's, but it's a completely different argument to say, look, you've been 33% at this activity so far. You know, maybe you can consider doing something else. So quantitative data <laughs> is always better. Um, so if teams could kind of use that mindset when in strategy discussions, I think that will help everyone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, a question that just came up uh, in the uh, chat here. How do the alliances get chosen? Can there be three rookie teams chosen for an alliance? So uh, I can explain this really easily, but one thing I want to say is if you're asking the question, how do the alliances get chosen at this point, I think it's really important for you and your team to sit down and read, go through the manual and read it because there's a full explanation in there. And if you're missing something like this right now, you might be missing other really important things. So I think it's really important for your team to have just as an exercise, you know, sit down and spend an hour going through the manual together just to kind of go through it. Um, alliance selection is, it seems complicated at first, but it's really simple. Um, so the teams are going to be ranked based on their win-loss record. Through, well, let's start from the beginning. In qualifying rounds, teams play on uh, pair, uh, threesomes of randomly paired up partners. So one match your partner, the next match they can be your opponent. Teams will play you know, between 10 and 12 qualifying matches, and they'll all be ranked based on their win-loss record. Uh, the tiebreaker, if two teams are tied with nine wins, the tiebreaker is the amount of assist points they recorded in all their matches, and there's a series of tiebreakers for that. Then the number one seed will come out, so the number one ranked team based on the amount of wins they have will come out to the field and say, hey, uh, we like to select team ABC for our alliance, and then ABC has the chance choice of accepting or declining. If they accept, they now form a permanent alliance with the number one seed that lasts throughout the rest of the competition. If they decline, it means they can no longer accept offers from any other alliance. And so this process continues with one through eight picking, and then they'll be able to, those eight alliances of two that have been formed will be able to pick a third partner, but this time the eight alliance picks first and it goes all the way back until the number one alliance picks last. And so that's the way it works in regionals. There's definitely the possibility of three rookie teams being on an alliance together, uh, nothing preventing from happening. But um, again, if you're asking questions about how does alliance selection work, it's really, really important that you take a good read through this manual because all those answers are in there. And if you aren't sure about the alliance selection, you're probably missing other important things. Great. Here's another question that says, can a robot put parts on and off the robot after inspection to accomplish their job at different positions? And the answer to that is absolutely you can. However, all of those different parts need to be weighed with um, the robot when you try to pass inspection. So for example, if your robot um, normally weighs 120 pounds, but then you have like a five pound goalie stick that you want to stick on there for certain matches, that wouldn't be legal because your combined total of weight would be 125 pounds. So you do need to get inspected with every possible configuration and everything that you could stick on the robot on your robot. Now, if your robot normally weighs 118 pounds and you have a five pound goalie stick, but then you take three pounds off your robot, put the goalie stick on, and never put that other three pounds back on, that's fine as long as you get re-inspected. Again, if you're asking a question like that, um, it's really important for you to read through the manual because the answers to those questions are in there, and there's a lot of other important things to, to read in there. And you should probably also tune in later on this year. To probably, uh, I believe First Canada is going to have a webinar with one of the uh, Ontario lead inspectors on 
call. And that'll be a really important one for you to listen into where so, you can ask specific inspection related questions. So say you have two different appendages that are interchangeable. Now do the does the robot um, drive base and whatever, the normal, plus those two appendages, do all three of those have to be weighted at the same time, even though only one of those appendages may be on the robot? Correct. The there, there's a specific rule about modular robots where um, all possible configurations have to be weighted. Mm -hmm. But again, I really urge the people who are asking specific rules questions like that, it's so important to go through the manual and read this stuff. Don't trust us. What do we know? I mean, <laughs> we can give you suggestions, but we're not official. The manual is the actual official guideline for you. So. Yeah, so Karthik, uh, you make a really good point, um, the importance of understanding the rules and the gameplay and so on. So to help some of those rookie teams out there, would you describe at what point do you think a rookie team should be at at this point in the build season, in addition to obviously being well versed on the rules? Well, I mean, if a rookie team is watching this webcast today and they're hearing, oh, I didn't know about that rule, I didn't know about that rule, that's a sign that you really need to read the manual. Like, I mean, I'm not trying to be pedantic here, but that manual is so important. And if you don't read through it, you will get caught missing something at your event. Um, a rookie team entering the third, you know, the Tuesday of the third week, you need right now to have at least partially assembled your drive train. Hopefully, most of the rookie teams are using the um, the Kitbot chassis because it's right there for you. You don't have to order any other parts. You can build it right away. And if you are using the Kitbot chassis, it should be assembled by now. You've had two weeks and two days, and you've also had um, the quick build session that Ontario ran this year. If you're struggling as a rookie team to assemble your um, your chassis, well, every rookie team in Ontario has been paired with a mentor team. Get on the phone. Hop onto emails, uh, send them a, the Snapchat or whatever you guys use nowadays. Talk to your mentor team, get some help. If you don't have a moving chassis yet as a rookie team, it's about time to call your mentors and get them to help you out. So that's, you really want to have a moving chassis or close to being ready with a moving chassis and a concrete plan on what you want to be doing with your robot. Awesome, and that's that's something tough, especially as a rookie team, to like, you know, kind of know where you should be during the build season. But there's a ton of resources a lot of teams put out, um, kind of like schedules that they do, and that's a great place to start. And uh, but it's something you can um, develop on your own, you know, eventually, you know, years into into your life of your team. Yeah, and I think Karthik makes a really good point um, of encouraging these teams to. Uh, tax their mentor teams, their veteran teams that are there to help them and to keep uh, after them so that they get all the answers and they have a good sense of direction at this point in the season. Also, don't ever feel like you're bothering your mentor team because your mentor teams have been assigned to you for a reason because those are, um, you know, John Hobbins and First Robotics Canada chose those mentor teams because they feel that these are teams who have the ability to help but also they want to help. Every team who's mentoring a team this year requested, hey, we want a rookie team that we can help this year. And they're eagerly invested to see you guys succeed. Um, the, num you know, the biggest complaint I ever see out of the mentor teams each year is they always say, oh, our rookie didn't let us help them enough. We wanted to help them out, but they just, you know, they didn't call, they didn't answer emails, so they want to help you out. And as a rookie, you might not realize this, but the first robotics competition is unlike any other competition you've ever been to, where you're actually teams are actively helping out their competitors. It's just the spirit of what we do here. This isn't like going to you know um, a high school basketball tournament where people are you know you're not helping your opponent. You're not like teaching your opponent how to shoot free throws before the game, you know or you go to a cheerleading competition. You're not saying, hey, this is how you could improve your routine, you know, just a little bit. The judges would really think this is cool. But at First Robotics, that's what happens. Teams are actively helping teams prepare for the competition. So don't be afraid to ask your mentor teams for help. And especially when your mentor team emails you and says, hey, is there anything you guys are behind on? Use that resource. It's so, so important to use that resource. Yeah, and Karthik, I, I got to mention that um, something I've seen your team do so often, uh, when these teams come to a tournament, and sometimes a rookie team 
uh, feels perhaps that they're not up to snuff so they don't go to a tournament and we know that every team at that tournament will do what they can to help that rookie team get set up so that they can get on that field and compete. It's just so darn important and it's just a terrible loss when we see a team not show up for an event. I can, I can make a promise to any rookie team this year. If you on ship day, or sorry, tag and tag days, or like uh, robots only half done, what's the point of even going to the competition? I can promise you, if you bring a half done robot to any regional event in Ontario, you will have a finished robot by the end of Friday at lunch. And you will be able to compete because the teams at the event will make it happen. And if, if you're struggling, come find John Hobbins at the event. Come find me. We will find multiple veteran teams who will be mm -hmm. eager to help you. We'll have students who join your whole team for the whole weekend. I mean, yeah, yeah, and we also have uh, FTS or first team support, which their main priority is to get every team functioning at the events. Just a be... personal witness to that happening up in Canada. I feel like every event that we've gone up to the past couple of years, we've seen that. I've seen Brandon Perniak, you know, you know, wrench in hand, you know, working on teams and helping teams out, and it's really awesome to see. Yeah, if I you think need, that's a great if... initiative in Canada, but also it's not. Um, it's not uncommon across all of FRC. I know there's some people here listening that aren't from Canada. So, um, you know, we've seen that at Finger Lakes Regional. If you show up with anything that's not legal, something, show up there. There are teams that will help. Um, I guarantee it. Don't, add, you know, the worst thing you could do is just not show up to the event for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Yeah, and for sure, that's the beautiful thing about FRC and uh, First Robotics. But I have a skill testing question for Justin and or Mike. And this question would be, what is unique about the GTR West this year compared to any other regional? I don't know. <laughs> you don't, we caught you? I, I have a lot of I have a lot of answers. Um, it, it's in a high school, which is, you know, that's pretty unique for first time in Canada. Um, it, they're going to have that neat remote scouting room where you can uh, watch so matches on a webcast feed and do your scouting, you know, without having to stand beside people who are dancing the YMCA. So that's pretty <laughs> cool. Um, it's being hosted by one of the defending world champions. That's pretty yeah, awesome. You get to, you know, be in the room with, you know, the champions of the world. It's a Absolutely. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's, yes. Yeah, yes. It is a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. So I mean. You could, you know, do something else on your Saturday, maybe like the next provincial championships, and then on Sunday you could go and, and see this amazing event. Like the neat thing about the Friday, Saturday, Sunday event is, for all the people out there in the first community, you can compete on Saturday and then come home on Sunday and just go to um, watchfirstnow.com and watch GTR West, where you're going to see some of the best teams in first. I mean, two defending yeah. world champions, six ten and twelve forty one, will be competing there. Thirteen ten, who was um you know, one of the top teams, one, a finalist at IRI last year. Yep. And the resurgence, the rebirth of Team 188. So you're going to be seeing some of the best teams in Ontario who happen to be some of the best teams in the world at this week one event where on a Sunday you can just sit, put your feet up and watch this event. It's going to be sweet. Yeah. And uh, might I add to that conversation, and I'll ask from all three of you to speak on this, what would you anticipate for the Waterloo event this year? Water, water, water. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be uh it's gonna be a great event. Um especially with the poofs going to be there and it's uh is it week six? Week four. It's week four? Yeah, it's right in between our two. Yeah, so a lot of uh a lot of teams will have played at that point, a lot of matches will have been played, so strategies will be fine tuned. Um you're gonna have several uh world world class teams there, so it's gonna be uh crazy. Plus you'll have Karthik there, keeping the energy high. So Paul, too, as well, right? Yeah, yep, Paul. I will, I will oh, have yeah. my par partner in crime, um, <laughs> president of Extra Robotics, Mr. Paul yeah, Bobioli, uh, will be game announcing it. Yeah, i got to tell you, personally, um, Paul's an outstanding guy, and uh, I met him first, I believe, in 2004. I think he was the MC at the Michigan uh, event. And it was outstanding. He was just amazing. But I'd like to shift gears a bit here and ask uh, each one of you to consider for a moment sharing a specific piece of insight or tip for our teams out there that we haven't discussed yet that might be able to help these teams along their journey to success. Hmm. Well, I guess I'll go. We talked about it at Build Blitz, but with 
I don't know if it's too late in the season to even talk about it, but with all these robots that have come out, you know, never be afraid to um, see what other teams are doing, but don't leave it at that. Don't be satisfied with what other teams are doing with their robot. You know, make it make it your own. Take, you know, you can, by all means, but, you know, feel free to take some ideas and some concepts and some strategic designs from other teams, but don't stop there. Like, make it, make it your own and make it your own teams. <coughs> and, you know, excel and strive and strive to make it better. Yeah, I guess I would add on to that and say, uh, what I, I'm a big believer in what you get um, you get out of something, what you put into it. So Karthik kind of alluded to it with the YMCA dancing. If your purpose of this, uh, of being on a first team, is to go to events and have fun and dance, that's great. But if you want to get, uh, if you want to make your team better and you want to, you know, get to maybe the next level of, uh, level of FRC, when you're at events and you're surrounded by so many other people that love doing this, don't hesitate to reach out and talk to these people and learn as much as you can from them. Um, I've been doing this for 10 years. Mike's been doing this for 10 years. Our knowledge is not is, is so little based on what we've found necessarily through our own research. It's through talking with other people and learning from them. Mm -hmm. if, we had, if we had 10 years and we didn't talk to anyone else and try to get to the information that we have now on our own, it would take 50 years. Um, so go to events. Find Karthik, find Paul, find anybody that you want to talk to and learn from. Ask questions. Everyone's always more than happy to help. Because you literally might only get that opportunity once a year, yeah. you know, to talk to these people, to, to look at this robot, you know, that's there. And I would suggest anybody that's within, you know, relative and easy driving distance of Waterloo, of some of these other big regionals, is to do it. Like, just to be able to see firsthand the engineering that goes into these robots that are going to be there is incredible. And you know, don't don't be upset that you miss an opportunity to talk to somebody or to to check out a robot. Yeah, I think that's such a worthwhile comment. And just to add to that, that uh, so many teams tend to stay within themselves too much, yeah. where they're isolated. And the importance of um, uh, embracing what everyone else does, in addition to acquiring the knowledge, but to let people know what you're about at the same time. Sure. And uh, I just ask maybe Karthik to comment. Uh, not just about a tip, but um, sometimes teams, uh, they have a difficult uh, time with the idea of how much do they reveal or share with themselves globally, how much do they expose themselves to the rest of the FRC world, with, they sometimes have a fear that they're uh, showing too much. Sorry, John, what was the exact question there? Yeah, sorry. Well, basically, teams are sometimes resistant to uh, perhaps putting themselves out on public forums. Uh, you know, sometimes the teasers or here's what we're about, here's how far we've come in the season, and uh, some teams don't show anything until the ac actual competition. So would you comment on that piece? Well, I think some teams, I, I, you know, will be protective of their own design. However, even the teams who are protective of their own design, they're still willing to help and help other teams out with their design and trying to kind of iterate their concepts. So as much as some teams may be secretive, because I mean, you know, I think there's something, there's a neat lure, a lure to a kind of, you know, the six-week build season and then poof, a robot pops up on your screen. I think that's a very exciting time. Actually, you know, a quick plug for Mike and Justin, they do a specific yeah. show at the end of the build season for teams to release their robots on the yes, show. And yes. it's just because, I, and I mean, I, I hate telling stories like this because I sound so old and I look so young in this picture, but this is going to satisfy expectations. <laughs> but back um, when I did first, when I was in high school in 1998, um, one of the coolest things was going to the competition and seeing every robot for the first time because there was no YouTube back then. The internet was slow. It was hard to post <laughs> pictures. The internet was basically text-based. So the only way to see other robots was to go to a competition and just that moment on Thursday morning when everyone would start opening up their crates and you peek in to see what 47 had built and what 111 had built and what 71 built was so, so exciting. So I think a lot of the older teams like hiding their robots just to give people that kind of, whoa, that's what they're doing sort of thing. But, I mean, the flip side is, uh, even those teams who are still super, super secretive, if you were to email them and be like, hey, I'm struggling with our design, can you give us some advice? They would absolutely help. So I, I think that's important. As for my piece of advice, um, I think it's very important for 
Well, I'm going to do two separate pieces of advice. One for the younger teams, and one, well, one for everyone, but then one specifically for the teams who are trying to take it to the next level. Um, for everyone, a simple robot can excel at this game. You do not have to build the most complicated, crazy robot that catches, that throws the ball 40 feet down the field and into the goal. Well, actually, that, you wouldn't want to throw 40 feet into the goal. That's not legal. But you won't need to have this crazy long-distance shot with this you know, swerve drive that does all sorts of crazy things, a simple kick drive with a way of you know, picking the ball up off the ground and delivering it to the low goal will be super, super effective. You don't have to be that complicated. Now, for all the teams who are trying to take it to the next level and who are trying to emulate what they saw, you know, just to bring it full circle, but trying to emulate what you saw with Robot in Three Days and Team Boom Done and Orion and the Build Blitz teams, remember, you can do better than what they did. Now, I mean, that's not to say you need to overcomplicate, but if you're like, wow, I love the Team JVN pickup, well, I want to build it exactly. Do you really want to build it exactly? Or you still have four weeks where you can improve on it. How about you mock up a Team JVN pickup and then iterate and see what you can improve upon? I mean, I look at that Team JVN pickup and I see one thing right away that should be improved upon. And I think most people who've seen it will be able to figure it out. There's like a giant bar in front of the rollers. It was the same thing on the Team Copioli pickup. It's going to interfere with the ball. Maybe you guys can figure out a way to get rid of that bar. And you want to be trying to improve. It's like, well, those teams all use Versa wheels for the pickup because they have good traction. Maybe you could find something with better traction. They used two wheels. Maybe you want to have a row of six wheels. Maybe eight wheels is it. Maybe you want to have a full-length roller. You need to experiment with these things. Um, by simply just emulating and trying to copy the teams that have already done stuff, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage because there's going to be so many other teams who look to what those teams have done and are going to try and improve and excel upon that. The robot in three days and that whole process that these five groups did have raised the bar for FRC in general, but they've raised the floor. And if you think I'm just going to be at that level and I'm going to be great, you may find yourself at the new floor. Try and improve. It's all about raising the bar. It's all about trying to raise above your opponents. So that's my piece of advice. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, you, you make a really good point about um, the robot in three days. It, it not only shows what can be done, but it certainly raises the confidence of everyone that they too can be successful in a six-week period rather than just three days. I want to personally thank all of you for what you've done and First Canada and the First Community applauds the efforts that um, you put forth to help and uh, to elevate the play of all teams. Uh, you've mentioned about the, how important assists are only valuable if they result in a goal. You talked about triple assist is the key to the game. A uh, human player is an uh, uh, extra set of eyes on that field and that picks happen according to the robot's ability to facilitate progression. So these are all super points. Um, I'd like to give an opportunity for Mike and Justin to uh, just tell the audience a bit about their show and when the audience can catch their show. Yeah, we, uh, we run a weekly show um, that happens um, when competition season starts and we usually maybe do a show before uh, the week before. Uh, we're thinking our shows are going to be on Tuesdays this year. Um, as opposed to Wednesdays, um, but we usually, uh, you want to talk about our website and the voting system? Yeah, so we have a, a brand new website, fctop25.com. We have some new features based on our awesome partnership now with, uh, with Vex Pro. But if you go there, um, if, if you go there at any point, um, you're going to see the vote tab. It's not live yet because we're not accepting votes right now. Um, but it's a very simple voting process, and then every week, you know, the week following the votes, um, Mike and I host a web show. It usually runs about an hour, hour and a half, where we count down the top 25 teams in FRC as voted on by the first community. Um, this will be our fourth season. We have a great time doing it. Um, and it's really allowed us to have some great opportunities like this to talk to you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, so keep your eye out for that. And also, kind of the, the first big event is going to be February 22nd, which is our premiere night. We talked about it a little bit. That's where we're going to have, you know, dozens of teams. Uh, submit their videos to us, and then we're just going to have kind of a marathon watch session and, you know, celebrate the accomplishments of all these teams. Last year we had over 40 teams submit videos. We had over 700 people watching. So it was big last year, and we expect it to get bigger this year. Yeah. So 
Yeah, so again, that's frctop25.com. And uh, we just it's a great opportunity just to talk about a lot of teams and just and just get together weekly with other first addicts across the country and across the world and just talk robotics for a couple hours every week. And, uh, we love it. And if you haven't watched the show yet, um, we'd love to we'd love to have you. Um, I'll be definitely tuning in, but I have to say, uh, man, you're moving it from Wednesday nights to Tuesday nights. Wednesday night was a tradition for our team where we'd sit in our hotel getting ready for our competition on Thursday, and we'd watch <laughs> you guys. So, And well, then, you know, on Thursday, a lot of on Thursday in the pits, on yeah, no, you, I totally understand why you're doing it, but there was something cool, you know, on Thursday in the pits, everyone's talking about what was said on FRC Top 25. <laughs> like, I remember last year in Waterloo, um, we, one, he's now one of our new mentors, said something pretty dumb in the chat. And so, like, there was a bunch of people bugging him about that in the pits. On, oh, well, maybe not a bunch. Yeah. Maybe it was just me who was bugging him about it. But, I remember that story, yeah. though. I think he told us. Yeah. Yeah. We were yeah. Stuff. yeah. But a cool part of the show is that it's really, it's really kind of uh, evolved past just the top twenty-five list. The top twenty-five list has almost been secondary. Um, a lot of the benefits that teams get from it are just the discussions that get brought up in the chat and the discussions that we have, like with Mike said, with other first addicts uh, around the world, so that's always been fun, and we hope you definitely find a way to do it. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, now, if, if you guys are doing it on Tuesday night, I'm more will, I'm more available to be a guest if you guys need me or whatever. Oh, so. great. Yeah. yeah, we'll probably definitely take you up on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's great, guys, and thanks so much. We're going to certainly promote your show up here in Canada and make sure that people get the uh, tremendous benefits from the show, just like everyone else. Uh, Karthik, thank you so much for all you do for FIRST Robotics, uh, not just in Canada, but on a global basis. And Mike and Justin, um, very valuable what you guys do and the passion that you put forth. We, we all appreciate everything that you do, and uh, I want to thank you personally. No, Take care, you and uh, uh, oh, you're very welcome, and we look forward to the next time. Yeah, all right, thanks.